TRG listeners. This is Dylan Greenwood along with Harold Eustache of Greenwood Law. And we're here to present to you this Sunday morning for the record with Greenwood Law. And today we're going to be talking about, uh, about how people get into court and sort of demystifying the court process. So we're going to take it all the way through from you know, when somebody is cited or arrested or how that comes about all the way to, you know, it being in a court of law and, and how that kind of works from that point forward. Uh, the biggest chunk of this is uh, a concept called a pleading document or criminal pleadings. There are um, all types of pleadings in the law, uh, whether it be civil or criminal. Um, from a civil standpoint, uh, almost every lawsuit starts off with what's called a complaint. Somebody's complaining about something and it goes from there and you got to answer it. There might be counter complaints and mm-hmm. all the stuff back and forth, all sorts of pleadings. Criminal stuff, uh, however, is um, in some ways not as straightforward and in some ways more straightforward. Uh, the process and the and the path of what it takes to, to go along the the court process, I would say, is more straightforward. The number of pleadings that kick off a criminal thing is not as straightforward. Um, so we're going to c- kind of break all that down. Um, so the first thing is to even get to a point where you're having an interaction with a law enforcement officer or, in the state of North Carolina, a, another our favorite person not favorite. Uh, you can to get some sort of criminal liability. There has to be probable cause, and so a magistrate determines whether or not there's probable cause to say that you know some sort of criminal charge should manifest, and so that can come out a number of different ways. It can. Um, just to go back for a second, for our listeners, a magistrate is a judicial official, and I think we've talked about this way, way back maybe a year or so ago, but a magistrate is a judicial official um, that is uh, not elected, doesn't have to be an attorney, but is uh, essentially a part of, uh, appointed or hired by uh, the court system, I'll say, that works to find probable cause and, uh, and, and other things and set bonds and stuff like that um, for people that are uh, accused of a crime. I know one of the things we deal with a lot is somebody saying, uh, I was charged, and not really understanding what that means. And we're going to kind of yeah. talk through what, uh, how you get charges and, um, and that whole process. I don't know about you, but the other common one I get is somebody calls up about like a speeding ticket, mm-hmm. and they go, well, this, this isn't going to be on my criminal record, is it? And the thing is, is, no matter how you are charged with something, whether it's just a speeding ticket all the way on up to first degree murder, it is on your your record, your criminal record. Traffic offenses, substantive criminal offenses, whatever it might be, they're, they're on your criminal record. It's just that nobody really cares about your speeding tickets typically, right. unless you got a lot of them. Right. You know, that, that can be, that can make a difference. But the reason why we have pleadings is because of our constitutional rights. You know, we talk that, about that a lot on our program about how it's important to know your constitutional rights. And this one involves what's called due process. So you hear that term thrown out a lot. Oh, well, you've got due process of law. Somebody's afforded due process rights. And that's a legal concept here in the United States that other people, other countries have adopted as well. And we, we hold it, we somewhat take it for granted, but it is such an important legal concept to say, You've got to have some sort of notice. You've got to understand what you're being charged with. You have to have the opportunity to respond to what you're being charged with. All that stuff is due process. So from a pleading standpoint, the pleading has to meet certain benchmarks. Right. So it has to name the jurisdiction that you're getting the charge in. It has to name the charge itself with some amount of specificity so that you are on notice about how to defend yourself. Right. So dates Mm -hmm. are big, what the actual, like, 
I'm not saying a full factual recitation as to what happened, but at least enough to go on to say, yes, you got this charge because you did this other thing. Right. It's so one charge I think of specifically is it, that's a common charge and a good way to think about this before we get into what different kinds of pleadings is a second degree trespass or a trespass offense. And so if you were charged with if somebody, you know, showed up to your door and said, hey, here's a criminal summons for a trespass, but it gave you the jurisdiction and said, you're accused of trespassing for Scythe County and that's it. Well, that's not enough to really understand uh, what that means, where the trespass occurred, when it occurred, and for you to mount a defense. So you're not really on notice enough. Mm -hmm. So it would have to, as, as Dylan said, it would have to have some uh, higher level of specificity about, well, you trespassed at the Walmart, you know, on June 10th, and that gives you a bit more context to understand how to prepare a defense against that uh, level of specificity. Right, and it also gives you enough notice so that if you were charged with the same thing before and you defended yourself against it, and let's say you got a not guilty or no, really no matter how it was disposed, mm -hmm. it puts you on notice to be able to mount a defense to say, hey, this is double jeopardy. I can't, I can't be charged and convicted for the same thing over again when this thing has already been uh, taken care of in court before. And that's a big concept in the standpoint that you know you don't you can't be charged and convicted of things twice the only quote unquote exception to that is when it comes down to state versus federal charges you can be charged and convicted in state court and in federal court for the exact same thing right the reason why is because the United States we have a dual sovereignty system of government so the state has its own government, the United States has its own government, and each government can choose to prosecute you if they want to for the same type of crime. So that is the one exception, the notable exception to double jeopardy, at least as it is to a pleading issue. Right. Well, so the first, um, and I think easiest one to think about um, as far as a criminal pleading would be a citation. And that would be, you know, you're driving on the road, you see blue lights behind you, officer pulls you over, talks to you about why he pulled you over, he or she pulled you over, and it's for speeding, let's say, and uh, he goes back to the vehicle, comes up with a sheet of paper and hands it to you and says, you gotta be in court on such and such date. Um, and that would typically be a citation because that is a criminal pleading that is given from a law enforcement officer. And that type of uh, citation uh, means that the officer um, not only f had reasonable suspicion to stop you, but also found probable cause that, uh, uh, that you committed some sort of criminal offense. And speeding would be a criminal offense. And that citation um, is going to give a specific date of when it happened. The, the charge itself typically will have the, uh, the statute um, that you're charged under. We'll have your name, all sorts of information. We'll have your court date and all sorts of stuff on that one citation. A lot of times, those citations are sort of pre-filled out pieces mm -hmm. of information so that it makes it easy for everybody to kind of look at it, know exactly what's going on, and it gets you to court. And that's what, again, a charge is. It is a mechanism to get you to court. So the first one, again, is a citation. Pretty yeah. easy. Um, but... It, that citation can range from uh, an infraction all the way to some sort of other misdemeanor or, mm -hmm. or felony um, that 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 uh, then you can be arrested on and then if you're arrested that you would have to go in front of a magistrate right and there's actually a push to do more by citation uh, criminal summons so that you know people wouldn't be uh, put have to go in front of a magistrate or a district court judge throughout COVID because prison confined populations were obviously an issue, and I mean to some extent still are because we have a very high population in the jails uh, in and around North Carolina. So there has been this overall 
sentiment of if at all possible to try to use one of these other charging documents to compel mm -hmm. you to come to court but not make it so that you have to get a bond or go in front of a magistrate for right. the possibility of getting a bond and so the second version of that is a criminal summons we see criminal summons most often used arguably mm -hmm. When a private individual right. goes to the magistrate's office, tells the magistrate what somebody did to them, and the magistrate determines whether or not there's probable cause to charge that other individual with a crime. North Carolina is one of the only states that allows for private individuals to go down and swear out charges against somebody in this fashion. It is typically for a misdemeanor offense, especially in the private warrant sense mm -hmm. of it. Um, I've never seen a private warrant for a felony. Um, I don't think it's I haven't. I haven't seen it. You typically have to go through a law enforcement officer. A criminal summons can charge felonies, though, but from right. a private standpoint, I don't think I've ever seen it. And so basically what a criminal summons is, is it's just to summon you to court. Uh, it's putting you on notice about the charge, about the date in which you have to appear before um, a court official, and you that you can be held in contempt of court should you fail to appear. And um, the court date, there's a specific rule with the summons that a court date has to be set within one month of the issuance of the summons unless the judicial official notes some sort of cause for setting the later court date. And that's for speedy trial issues, that's because a summons is, it's looked at different. It is. It is looked at different. It's, it's, when we see summons, we think different things as attorneys because we do this all the time. Um, it, it sort of sets off certain certain things in our mind. Um, and, and an important caveat recently in the law with the summons is that if if a person goes out, swears out charges, as we said, is specific to North Carolina, on their own without a law enforcement officer, officer uh, now a summons has to be issued, has to be a summons, unless there's some sort of sp specific findings by the magistrate. Um, and a lot of times that has to do with uh, assault charges. Um, specific types of assault charges like assault on a female that are domestic um, but typically you know if it's a you know hey somebody communicated a threat against me and I'm taking this charge out it, it will be a summons and a lot of times that is um, served on a person the same way uh, a civil um, suit is served on a person what be it you know let's say a domestic violence protective order or just some more some other sort of civil lawsuit is served on a person so it would be physically handed over to you hey you've got to appear in court um, you're summoned to court um, by this document um, so a lot of times you know that that will not result in, in an arrest um, that's just served on somebody right and so the one of the most common ways in which somebody can be served is through an arrest warrant an arrest warrant is when a, a judicial official, and so it can be a magistrate, it can be a district court judge, it can be a superior court judge. Um, usually when judges do it, it's colloquially referred to as a bench warrant mm -hmm. uh, because they it's an order for your arrest because you didn't appear in court right. or uh, related to some sort of contempt. But a judicial official issues an arrest warrant for they can do it for any criminal offense supported by probable cause. And so what typically happens here is a law enforcement officer does some sort of investigation. It could be a short investigation because they witnessed something happen personally. It could be a long investigation like for you know some sort of um, like a, a murder or something yeah. like that that's very involved. And they go and present the whole case. Uh, or as much of the case as they need to establish probable cause to a magistrate. And the magistrate will issue the arrest warrant, and then that arrest warrant needs to be served upon the individual that's accused. 
Once that happens, that person is arrested, they're handcuffed, and they have to go back, they're called in front of the magistrate. And so they have to get processed, they have to get fingerprinted, all that stuff, it, it sets off a whole series of events. And then at that point, a magistrate would determine conditions of bond, unless it is some sort of domestic violence issue. In that case, that has special rules where you have to go in front of a district court judge. But um, magistrate can set, give you a written promise to come back to court, can set an unsecured bond where you're not having to pay money, can set a secured bond where you do have to pay money. I mean, there's a lot of different ways in which right. you can get out on pretrial release pursuant to an arrest warrant. Uh, but the warrant for arrest, as you can see, triggers a lot of different requirements, which was why there was that push for criminal summons and citations and that sort of thing. Right, because then there's a lot more personal interaction. Right. Because these arrest warrants, as, as Dylan said, you have to be arrested. Um, it doesn't mean you're necessarily going to jail or going to mm -hmm. sit in jail, but it does mean that there's a process of, of arrest that happens there. Um, a, another uh, citation, or not citation, excuse me, another uh, criminal process that we see is uh, a statement of charges. And this is one... Uh, a misdemeanor statement of charges is one that we see a lot of times used by prosecutors and is used um, in order this is not this is a this doesn't necessarily start you can't just make a, a prosecutor can't just say you know I think that this person committed a crime um, out of thin air and just do a misdemeanor statement to have the person you know arrested or something this is a, a, a statement of charges generally amends some others you know either a citation or um, a warrant or some other criminal process um, uh, and and basically it's used uh, uh, it, it can be superseding and, and is used to keep the case going in some sort of way I know that was kind of amorphous but but the the way we see this happen practically is a person is charged with let's say something simple like driving um, 40 miles at 40 miles an hour over the speed limit and you know in some sort of negotiation with the defense attorney the prosecutor agrees to reduce that charge uh, reduce that infraction uh, or sorry charge to um, driving 15 over for some complicated issues with DMV there's a reason behind it but they would need to amend that and it would need to be done via misdemeanor statement of charges. The prosecutor would just write it up. It's, a, it's an AOC form, Administrative Office of the Courts form. They would write up um, the charges, and it needs to, does have to have some specificity behind it. It needs to you know, give um, some sort of factual basis of what happened and be signed by the prosecutor, and then that would supersede those charges and, and keep the case going that way. So it is something that, that is used pretty often mm -hmm. Uh, in court, and a lot of times it happens right in court. Um, the most common form of pleading that we see with like DWIs, DWIs can be charged with a citation. I've seen that before, okay. but more commonly with a DWI is what's called a magistrate's order, mm -hmm. where somebody is arrested not with an arrest warrant, so a magistrate hasn't predetermined probable cause. There's a law enforcement officer out in the field who determines on the spot whether or not there's probable cause. They bring, they arrest that person, bring them in before the magistrate, and then the magistrate issues a criminal process pursuant to that arrest. And that is, that's a magistrate's order. Right. Um, because a lot of times where it works in DWI is that if you elect to do the field sobriety tests, you're, you know, you're giving the officer all the information mm -hmm. to get uh, probable cause. Uh, which you don't have to do, but if you do it and they get probable cause, they arrest you. They will then bring you down for you to do breathalyzer machine, typically at the jail. Depending on what you blow, they take every bit of that information before a magistrate, and the magistrate issues a magistrate's order. Um, the other types of criminal pleadings that we see uh, relate specifically to um, Superior Court and those are bills of information and indictments. Indictments are something that uh, when you hear about a grand jury, 
it means that a felony has been charged. Felonies, when they are charged, go to district court here in North Carolina until they are presented to a grand jury. The grand jury is then presented the case, and then that case, they determine whether or not there's probable cause for the felony indictment for it to go to superior court. And once they make that determination and they return their findings, then that in indictment is either returned true or it is it the case stops at that point yeah um, the other one is a bill of information and this is kind of circumvents the um, the grand jury aspect of the whole thing and allows a prosecutor to uh, draft a bill of information and if it is consented to with the defense counsel and the uh, defendant, then it can be pulled up to Superior Court through that Bill of Information. If you're just joining us um, on For the Record with Greenwood Law, we are talking about ways to get to court in the criminal sense. So uh, be it uh, district or Superior Court, uh, there are various criminal pleadings and we're talking through several of them. We were talking about ways to get to Superior Court via an indictment or a bill of information and one of the ways that that we see bills of information happen a lot because they have to be consented to by the prosecutor and defense and people would think why would you do that a lot of times that happens with plea agreements or there's some sort of um, plea that is already agreed upon by by both sides and it's advantageous for both sides to circumvent an indictment and just get it into superior court and, and get it pled somehow um, so that's generally how you'll see that done uh, I know that at the beginning we talked about how we're going to, how these things get you to court, but what happens when you get there? Mm -hmm. So that's that's the interesting thing that people ask us a lot is, you know, what's going to happen on my first court date? Right, and you know, a lot of people think the first court date, you know, they're going to be, it's going to be determined whether or not they're guilty or innocent. Uh, typically not. Uh, that's just not how it works. Most, especially now, with how we're trying to get court back. Um, now that we're getting on the the better side of all the things with the pandemic, uh, it it becomes it's become uh, because we have a, a lot of people coming through court and everything else. The likelihood of your case getting resolved on the first court date is not that high. Now that depends on the jurisdiction you're in. You know, we've got some smaller counties that you know maybe it could, but more often than not, that first court date that's not going to happen. The reason why is because the court needs to determine what you want to do about counsel, and so you have the opportunity to hire your own, represent yourself, or ask for a court-appointed attorney. If you ask for court-appointed, you have to meet certain financial things, and you fill out an affidavit, and the court determines whether or not you're afforded the valuable services of a court-appointed attorney. And then if you are given a new date, that's called a continuance. And then some, at some point, I mean, you may have many more court dates before your case gets resolved, or it may get resolved on the next court date. There's a number of reasons why that may happen or how it could happen that way. Uh, sometimes it's the availability of the witnesses or whatever else. Um, but th in general, that's how it happens until there's a, some sort of determination about your specific case. And so, Harold, what are some of the ways in which cases can get resolved? Well, there's, there's many, many ways cases can get resolved, but to make it very simple, um, if your case is continued to a certain date and it's going to be heard, um, you can either be found guilty via a trial or a plea. You can plead guilty to a case. Um, you could plead not guilty, and if you plead not guilty, there typically would be a trial, um, and you would go through that trial, and if you're found not guilty, that'll be the disposition of your case. Um, your case could be dismissed by uh, the prosecutor um, for, for numerous reasons. Your case could be dismissed um, via a voluntary dismissal. Your case could also be dismissed via what's called a deferred dismissal. So the, there are these arrangements that are enter, entered into, some of them statutory in North Carolina and some of them uh, not statutory. 
but there are these arrangements that are entered into with the state and the defendant where the defendant typically has to do something. If they do do those things, the case is dismissed. Um, and it, lastly, it can also be dismissed by the court for, for various reasons as well that we kind of don't have time to get into. Maybe one day we will, but those are the quick ways that your case can be disposed of. Um, so we went through a lot here that typically would take weeks of, of a law school class to sort of parse through all of this. And I know we did that quickly, but we hope that you learned a little bit today about uh, the criminal process, how to get to court, um, when you're charged with something, the different ways that that can happen via citation, um, via a warrant, via um, a, a misdemeanor statement or, or to get you to district court or to superior court, an indictment or a bill of information. So hopefully that provided quite a bit for you. Yes, y'all. Thanks for joining us here on WTOB this morning. But before we go, do not forget that Greenwood Law Bill of Rights. And that's first and foremost, I will not represent myself in a court of law. Second, I will not do law enforcement's job for them. Three, I will not make statements when stopped by law enforcement. Four, I will not consent to searches when asked by law enforcement. And five, I will not be my own star witness for the prosecution. Stay safe out there. Stay informed. This is For the Record with Greenwood Law signing off.